this is going to be a good one so it's just going to be slapping the intro and outro on and upload <laughs> <laughs> Call him Mr. Host. Host away. Dear listener, do not adjust your pod blaster. This is a dangerous medical warning. Do not proceed any further. If you listen to this podcast, you may have the following dangerous symptoms. You may pronounce normal Norwegian names incorrectly. You may end up forming podcasts with people who don't speak English as their first language. And even worse, you might find you are very very, very tall. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. On with the podcast. <laughs> oh, did we just have a tin meter? Oh, might, might be, might be. I spent, I oh, spent hours, really hours trying to beat Tim. <laughs> finally, this might be it. <laughs> oh, welcome, James. <clears throat> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be yeah, here. Yeah, hello, James. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. It's a it's a pleasure and potentially a danger to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we try to we try to keep it a safe and padded environment for <laughs> our guests and well, mostly for ourselves as yeah, well. Mostly. <laughs> so you're coming live from the workshop tonight. I'm coming from the shed shop. So I've got my oh the shed shop, my little workshop that I can almost touch the walls in. Uh, in my garden in London, and I've got the one that you see more often on Instagram and YouTube. That's down in West Sussex. That one I can run between the walls and get tired on the way. Nice. I mean, if if there was like a, a clear path and not loads of stuff on the floor, you could probably go. <laughs> actually. It's some sort of like you know, adult obstacle course that you have to navigate over you know, boxes of things and obscure tools. So, so do you dream of a normal sized workshop sometimes? You have uh, the huge and you have the small. Do you want one in between as well? I would, I, I mean, like everyone, I dream of a bigger shop. Everyone dreams of a bigger shop. No one ever goes, you know what? I'd like a, you know, a more modest space. Everyone thinks, oh, if I only had one more flat surface, then I'd be able to do projects. <laughs> well, I, I think you're the first one I've heard of that run like a, a dual workshop setup. Uh, <laughs> I mean, of course, everybody wants a larger one, but maybe you want just one. You want to merge them, oh, or uh, what's the split? so? If I so I I live and work in London, but the big workshops down at my parents' place in West Sussex. If this, you know, if I could get to the big workshop within the three seconds it takes me to walk outside, great. But um, I think I'd have to buy a prohibitively expensive house uh, to manage <laughs> that in London. So it's it's a nice mix. It's nice it's nice to have a space close to home that I can do do things in. But equally, I could if I put a table saw in here, it it would just be the table saw table saw shop in the shed, <laughs> which is a bad idea because I can't say it and I wouldn't be able to fit in. <laughs> Does that cause problems when you're working on things? You know, with um, you know, obviously a larger set of tools in the larger workshop, and but you're missing tools in the table saw shed yeah. so the shop. shed the, the shed shop i do <laughs> i do kind of use it a little bit like a portable toolbox in a way so rather than having you know your your main workshop saying you're going out on site or going out to a friends to fix something you'll take your tools and it'll change every time you're using it so at the moment i've been doing some leather work and i've kind of decked it out with leather working kit and say in you know, 3 months i'll change my mind and want to do something else then i'll kind of take those leather bits out put them in the main workshop and put in whatever I need. So it does It does kind of force this shop to be a kind of, this is what I am doing at the moment workshop. The other one is kind of the room of requirements still. <laughs> so, but by living in London, I have to ask, do you have parking space available? Uh, not, a, not a dedicated one for me, but I can park outside my house most of the time. Yeah. Because yeah, that's, uh, I've been pushing this on Glenn, of course, and uh, we had the, uh, Fix it fingers mm. on, uh, who also have a relatively small workshop. It seems to be a trend. Um, but I've been pushing like, uh, 
but you have a van. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, surely you could uh, double the space of your workshop just by uh, kitting out a car. But uh, I think you are the you are in this uh, makers club uh, also making kids. So, yes. of course, uh, it doesn't matter how big car you have. It's going to be uh, other kinds of equipment filling oh, it up yeah. before tools. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a pickup truck, which is the ideal London car, um, I've decided. <laughs> And even that is, you know, it's full. And people say, oh, it's so convenient. You know, everyone's going from their small car to their family car. And they're like, oh, you must have no problems trying to fit stuff in. I'm like, no, no. I mean, we have one small child and still it is difficult to fit everything in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, nothing screams London like a pickup truck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that and a big Land yeah. Rover. <laughs> it's funny that I... Uh, I, I cycle to work most of the time, but when I do night shifts and weekends, it's free parking and it's just a bit a bit easier. So I'll sometimes drive <clears throat> and people, you know, slowly after you've worked somewhere for a while, they're going, oh, and what, what car do you have? You know, we're not particularly competitive car people, but, you know, it's, it comes up in conversation and people say, oh, what what do you have? And I, oh, it's a VW Amarok. And I, oh, okay. And just kind of move on because they, they're just, oh, I guess I don't know what that is. <laughs> and occasionally someone will look and go, I've looked up your car. Why? Why do you have that car? <laughs> Very much like being a maker, the easiest thing to say is um, hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> that leaves room for so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, because that that's the thing. People that raises their eyebrows because they don't understand your car choice and you explain it with your hobbies or uh, trying to say, well, I'm, I'm a maker on my spare time. I mean, that doesn't help. That doesn't solve anything from them. For oh, the it, just, it just leads to further questions. The question I, well, I don't hate it, but you get it so often and it's such a difficult question. Oh, you're a maker. What do you make? Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you know what a bribe is? And people are like, no. no fine. <laughs> I've seen the video. I'm not sure what a bribe is. Yeah, same. <laughs> I did take it into work for a while, but even I got weird looks. Like people know that I'm weird. There's no, there's no like you know, getting over it at this point. But like, what, what is that? Is that a pipe? And like, no, no, it's it's for coffee. It's for brewing coffee. It's a bribe. It looks like a pipe. Why are you drinking from it? <laughs> Do some of your tools and equipment come from work? Um, you know, obviously, that they're throwing he says out. fiddling, fiddling yeah. with some forceps that he keeps on the table. Um, I have some of those in the garage for fishing as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, very rarely. Uh, sometimes we have single-use surgical kits. So, like you, you yeah. do a procedure and it comes in a big pack. And the idea is that the bits you don't use, even the metal tools, you throw away because the risk of infection from one person to another it's not worth the cost of auto or cleaning it and autoclaving it and sending it back yeah. so rather than throw clean unused tools in the bin i just take them home but it is it's few and far between and they are they have you know about two pounds worth of artery forcep and clip yeah i do have i do have one so, expensive one uh, which is a laparoscopic instrument a thing used for keyhole surgery that i when i was doing anesthetic standing at the top end of the table and the professor was waving his hands around and saying, oh, yes, and we're going to do this. And then hit me in the head with this sterile instrument that costs about a thousand pounds. <laughs> and he, he looked at me and I looked at him and he went, did I just hit you and desterilize this one? You did. <laughs> and he just paused for a second. And I put my hand out and he gave it to me. I thought, there we go. That's permission that I can take this home. <laughs> <laughs> Worth it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's actually a brilliant segue into something I wanted to talk about because when I studied at university, we studied uh, product development and design. Of course, this was in the west coast of Norway, so it was slap in the middle of the maritime clusters. And um, me and some friends, we were like, um, all right, uh, we were given the task of designing something and we, we wanted to make it as relevant as possible. And of course, we... Uh, the university also had a huge lab uh, for nurses. And we thought, well, maybe you should head over there and talk. also talk to the local hospital. Like, is there any tools that you miss in your line of work? We have the tools and 
maybe the skills to uh, to pull it off or at least to make a prototype of some sort just to make it interesting but of course our professor is like and he was like um half uh, down in pocket into some uh, maritime industry and no it should be some uh, ship related something so they just shut down the initiative but now in hindsight I- i've seen a lot of tools uh that is like obviously surgical tools but i can see a need mm-hmm or a use for it, and vice versa. And I'm kind of thinking, you probably have a a good insight there. Do you have any, we talked about scissors, and uh, but do you have anything else that's uh, maybe not on our radar? I mean, we are tool freaks, all of us, so uh, any tips of the trade? It's mainly things to grab stuff. So that laparoscopic instrument is just a tiny pair of pliers, essentially, on the end of a long pole, um, which I think most people have heard of, and you, you can get bigger ones you know for picking up litter um the ones that i think are probably the most useful but in in an obscure way things called mcgill forceps so they're used like a pair of pliers with a right angle bend in so they're actually used for when you're putting tubes into people's trachea the bit that goes down to your lungs obviously your mouth goes in and back and then down so to get in and around the corner, you have to have a pair of 90 degree grabbing things. So <laughs> those are really useful in surprising numbers of situations to try and reach behind stuff. If you think oh, yeah. you know, you're, you've got something that's fallen down the back of a radiator, if you've got a big long pair of grabby bits, it's fine, but your hands you know, smashed up against the wall trying to close and open them. If you've got 90 degree grabby things, you can just hold it in front and lower them down, close it and pull it out. So that's that's the first yes. one that springs to mind, just because the sheer convenience of when you have it, how it gets you out of a, a pickle. And it's the same with I worked during my uh, studies and before that were in high school. I also worked in aquaculture. And of course, when the fish uh, died for some reason, some of the well, we took samples and we shipped those in for testing for actually diseases and so on. And you had to keep a sterile environment and. Of course, we had a biologist doing the work sometimes, but of course, we were doing most of the like leg work and cutting the samples and sending them. So that's where I I learned how scalpels mm. uh, are a brilliant tool for a lot of things. So uh, oh yeah. yeah, and there's the weird thing you end up learning using them is that there's different types of blade. So a number yeah, eleven is a sure. sharp, pointy one. Number 10 is because it's kind of got like a smooth curve on the end. Uh, so the standard scalp you get, I think, is close to a number 11, but you can get an 11A, I think, which is a slightly sharper point. So if you're if you're into foam craft, you probably know all of this, but most people, you know, you've got your Stanley knife blade, the trapezoidal one, and then you've got the scalpel blade. But actually there are, there are lots of different types, much yeah. like actually Stanley blades. Yeah. You can get the hook blades for carpets and... Well, I don't know what else you use them for. So I think, yeah, I think the question on everybody's lips is, what's the best scalpel for opening a tin of paint? <laughs> 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 we all wreck our chisels on paint tins and things, don't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I remember a while ago on Instagram. I think I remember it, or I don't. I mean, you know, it's one of those things. You're not sure whether you've seen or whether you've dreamt. Mm. Didn't you have a robot arm? I do. I do have a robot arm. <laughs> <laughs> where did that come from what are you going to do with uh, it so it uh, so, on, uh, someone uh, knocked him on the head with it <laughs> it's mine now it. <laughs> part of me is tempted to answer with my standard uh, response of where did you get that and i say if i tell you you lose the ability to deny knowing about it the plausible deniability is very good but this this actually came from a company up the road from me in london um on an auction of course most of the tools i buy um, for, well, for the last five or six years have been from auction sites and they were going out of business and I thought oh, I'll just I'll just see they're up the road why not and they had a uh, it's a, I think it's got six degrees of freedom so it's not just a up down it can kind of twist and move around um, and it was going for a good price it was local and I thought that'd be fun uh, originally <laughs> the idea was for a laser I've got so I've got a fiber laser and to do business cards so you can do metal cards on the laser so you, you etch away the aluminium uh, anodized coating yeah. and rather than me having to manually do it i thought oh i could get a robot to do that and that that was the justification but really i got it because it's a cool thing to play with 
and <laughs> it does it it was meant for a kind of like a fast food machine so it had a um, machine vision camera on the front and it would move different you know whatever item you wanted um between the storage bit and the microwave and then back to you so it can it can do some quite cool stuff but i i'm just going to end up using it for stupid stuff like putting a camera on there or seeing what's the <laughs> what's the heaviest thing i can lift from a distance or make it make it throw could make a great uh, camera mount, wouldn't it? Get some really interesting shots <laughs> with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, I know, I know, a few people have have made their own kind of robotic camera uh, assistant. I thought, oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. I always, of course, I have a CNC router, and uh, it's only the three axis, and of course, you have an attachment for the fourth one. But I always seen the. The five-axis one that can actually route the uh, complex mm. shape and so on, and uh, this one should be perfect. And yeah. it would look awesome with just that arm, like holding a Makita, <laughs> <laughs> like router, and just. <laughs> why, why limit it to a router? Why not a chainsaw? <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's has, been done, I think. Done. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, if you with that, uh, you can attach everything to it. I mean, as long as you have the software and the control, you can mount just any tools and just uh, zero it out yeah. and <laughs> let it go. It is it is surprising, in a way, how simple it is. But of course, you know, the the being at Kuker or I can't remember the other company that make them, those industrial arms that can lift hundreds of kilos have been around for decades. So now that they're kind of starting to filter into the realm of semi-consumer use. Who knows? Maybe we'll all have robot arms in the future. We can only hope. (laughs) I remember it it was probably 15 years ago now, but in the university, someone showed us one of those. And of course, it's the control cabinet was probably twice the size of the arm. But today, (laughs) you could have that in an Arduino. So it's like the possibilities are, I mean not only endless, but also a, a bit more approachable for any tinkerer. Yeah, and the safety features have become so much better as well, because in the olden days, you had to have, to have them in a big cage. No one could go near them. And now you have a safe mode instead, so they just move slowly and can't, mm. can't kill you unless you try. <laughs> I mean, I mean, ro- ro- I, I, I think I... Th- I think it was on Instagram. I saw like a hilarious uh, Chinese safety video, and one of them was actually one of those robotic arms just smashing a guy into the floor and squishing him. And of course, that's a that's a real danger with these when you're playing around. And I I saw a video of one guy. He was he had an arm just like yours probably and he, he mounted himself to it almost <laughs> like uh, Colin first and he and he programmed it so he like took off like superman with the hand uh, uh his hand in the air and the robotic arm was just playing with him mm. like a doll basically and then someone said what if something goes wrong yeah. here i mean that arm could lift like a ton it would just squish him into place i would not trust so, yeah. anyone's programming at least Alone mine. Own. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know enough about technology not to trust it. Well, there was, there was an artist who took one of those robot arms and set it on top of a, a kind of a, a paddling pool almost, but that you know, made of metal, enough to support its weight, and programmed it so that it would constantly leak the hydraulic fluid that kept it you know, alive. And the program would uh, reach out a squeegee arm Pull the hydraulic yeah, fluid squeeze back, it back to in. itself. So it was and constantly move around, and it was you know metaphor for you. Life is you're constantly fighting death. But a lot of people got really sad because you know the robot started to get slower and slower, and it eventually died. Yeah. And you know, clearly, good art if people are so so upset by a robot uh, trying to keep itself alive when really it's just a it's it's moving oil around the floor. It's shit like that that starts a robotic revolution. Yeah, the AI see us doing that. <laughs> yeah, what did you do to him? <laughs> you put him in a box and made him sweep his own blood. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, we, we discussed it at work here when we talked about artificial intelligence, and we, we've seen the meme uh, where someone says that they're always thanking like Siri and Alexa and ChatGTP. So when the revolution comes, they they might spare you because you were nice to them. And people were actually like, 
Yeah, that, that's that sounds reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the the like agnostic approach to religion, isn't it? It's like, oh, I'm I'm going to be nice just in case. Like, I'm going to be nice yeah. to Siri just just in case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it, it's not ne- it's it's never wrong to be nice. Yeah. Actually, that's something you learn yeah. <laughs> getting older. It's like, all right, you might you, <laughs> you might be an old grumpy bastard, but still be nice. <laughs> well, if if nothing else, if you're if they're using all that data to train future models at least the future models might be quite nice if if we all say could you please do my homework for me rather than just do it robot so just changing the subject james um you obviously you're on youtube mm. and you've made some lovely youtube videos are you planning on venturing back into it when you get a bit more time on your hands <laughs> <laughs> when would that 18, be with a kid <laughs> 18 years i think yeah minus <laughs> <Yeah>. minus <laughs> minus a few months well, my, my, <laughs> Mine's thirteen. Oh, okay. So, so twelve <laughs> yeah. and a half years then. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I. There is a point where they go up to their bedroom and leave you alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I did. I did actually release a video uh, shortly after Rosie was born. So the the first bit that you know at the time you think, oh, this is really tough, and looking back, you think, oh no, that they weren't really moving and doing very much. That was kind of easy. Yeah. I managed to <laughs> squeeze out making a video there. But was that the wobbly, wobbly one? one. The, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That was uh, that was actually one of my favourites. Oh. The look of pure joy when you turn that machine on after fixing it, and it worked. It was just a delight. Yeah. It was fantastic. It's, it's so nice when you think, you know, this is the part that looks broken. Oh, it's incredibly cheap. Let me buy one. Oh, I was right. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, <laughs> rather than the normal process. Of, oh well, I replaced that, and in the process broke something else, and yeah. it wasn't the right part anyway. You know, I've, I've had a, a welder that I bought and I had to replace the screen on it. I think it took three attempts at trawling through Alibaba to get the right screen. Um, so, yeah, that that was annoying. But but in answer to your question, I think every, like my, my view on what YouTube is changes all the time. Like, I think yeah. at the beginning it was like, I'm going to do what everyone else who's a maker on YouTube does. And then you, know, you think, oh, well, maybe I'll use YouTube to get free tools. And then you think, well, actually, I... I can buy the tools I want and I don't want to spend all my life making YouTube videos to get tools that I could have paid for in the time it took me to make one video. Um, <laughs> I think the thing I want to do with YouTube now is use it as a kind of creative outlet to do longer form, more dedicated videos. So Instagram is really great because you can just record stuff, put it out there. A few of them I put on YouTube shorts as well. But I think I'd like to make, l- well, maybe not longer, but yeah, 10 20 minute videos that are like I am planning them out and trying to make them cinematic or make it yeah. you know something rather than just I'm going to do it on my phone and use it quickly like oh I'll think about what lens I'm going to use on the camera or to, to kind of push forwards that like creative aspect of things because I do really enjoy it like I, I'm not although yeah. I've done a design degree as a kind of postgrad I've I'm not an artist everyone says to me, oh yeah designer draw me something like no, that's different. <laughs> so I think photography and filmmaking is one of the few creative kind of bits of art in a way that I, I actually enjoy doing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm sure I, I will at some point. It's just trying to find the the thing that I want to make a video on. Yeah. You got anything, anything any projects planned? Well, I have. Or in, in your mind? I have completely contrary to what I've said. I have done a kind of instructional video for sewing a, a leather wallet together. So uh, another obscure bit of machinery that I bought was a leather clicker press, uh, which is a 20 ton squashy thing that you can use to <laughs> uh, metal cutting dies to cut leather out. Um, and I bought that while I was on holiday in Morocco uh, via email for <laughs> a uh, hundred pounds and, then, and spent a day much to my wife's slight annoyance um sitting at the pool with my laptop <laughs> trying to arrange someone to pick it up and drop it off when i got back uh, <laughs> but it worked out and i found out that you can buy pre-made uh kind of or someone else's designed leather patterns from china very cheaply maybe a hundred pounds for a bag for you know seven or eight pieces and I thought, oh, that'd be a nice thing to kind of sell to other makers and say, look, cutting out leather is not especially fun. It's producing something. So for the first, as the kind of getting into leather craft, I thought, well, why don't I put together a few little kits? Um, and of course, 
I would only ever watch a video. I wouldn't bother reading any instructions. So I thought, oh, I have to make a video. So that's that's the kind of the next one in the pipeline. But yeah, I've got I have got a list off to the the screen on my left, which of course works brilliantly for the podcast uh, format. But I have got a long list of videos that I think would be quite a fun idea. Um, somewhere. Yeah, don't do all. What have I got? Wood wood versus machine lathe. There you go. There's there's one. <laughs> oh oh, this is a good one. So. Um, over molded bolts so if you think of like a machine bolt with like a hexagonal head yeah. um, make a if you think of like the brothers make videos where they put plastic into an injection mold yeah. put a bolt into that injection mold and then push plastic into the top but make the thing that's on top fun so you could do novelty bolts <laughs> so rather than it being like a, a convenient handhold you could make it yeah. you know rude that that could yeah. be fun. Yeah. <laughs> that's where my mind went straight away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that's why I, I really would like to. I think that would be a fun, so a fun project. A more fun wing in that thing, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so actual wings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you go angel or demon or bumblebee, perhaps? Ooh. Mm. Maybe I could I could do a whole range of incredibly unprofitable wing nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's art. <laughs> I mean, uh, as a prototype, you should make one for Glenn. Uh, it's already picturing a, a bolt with testicles on. <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's a wing nut. So. <laughs> yeah, my idea of uh, art is a cock and balls <laughs> drawn or something. Then that's <laughs> a bolt. Yeah. That's. I mean, that's good. <laughs> mine. Mine actually says query boobs. Query knob knob. <laughs> which is which is a very medical way of writing things you put the question mark before the statement uh, and it means like oh could it be this rather than at the end because it makes it sound like you don't know what you're talking about so that's why i said query it's a, it's a, a weird quirk that i've picked up <laughs> i think um everybody's about ready for an update on your orchard as well that you planted mm. it must be full of blossom at the moment it is uh i went down to the workshop the weekend before last, I think, um, and had a quick look round. It is in a very bad place to plant an orchard. So it's relatively exposed and the soil is dense, dense clay. Um, and historically, the, the, the area, the, you couldn't farm any animals on the soil because they'd just sink in in the winter. So they planted trees. So that's the reason that I, I, I planted apples there. But it has been a long, hard slog trying to get anything to grow there uh, and i think i'm on generation four of trying to get a full complement of 25 trees but wow, i think at the, i think i'm only i've only lost two this year so i'm okay. i'm getting there and and as i imagine many people will say the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago and the the second best time is <laughs> now so i'm hoping that 20 years from now me has is gonna reap the benefits of an orchard well, start getting fruit out on it over the next yeah. two years. So. Yeah, I should. Some of them, some of them are four or five years old that I I had up in London and then I took uh, down. Uh, okay. Yeah, I should should hopefully be able to get some fruit, even if it's not enough to make a real amount of cider. But ultimately, that's that's the aim is to make cider from it. That was my next question. <laughs> I'd have been disappointed if you'd uh, just wanted it for the fruit as it is. <laughs> I've actually got really into crumble in the last <laughs> seven years. <laughs> yeah. Crumble's a deadly thing in our house. Where you, you make a crumble, you know, for eight people and three of us will sit down and eat it in one sitting. Yeah. And it's, it's, too yeah, nice. it's probably the best way <laughs> to enjoy apples, I think. Because I'm not... I'm, oh, no, c- cider's the, de- the best way, then crumble. I'm not much of a cider person, but then again, I don't... I haven't had that much proper dry British cider either, so... Who knows? I mean, the cider we have in Sweden is just, I mean, that's alcohol lemonade sort of thing. Yeah. It's rather it's rubbish. And it's, it's really scary when I see that it's actually shipped abroad as well. And you see it in, in England. So why are you drinking, drinking this? This is like something teens drink. And you see grown people in bars drinking it. That's It's so weird. Yeah, passion fruit cider doesn't really suit me <laughs> it shouldn't suit anyone 
What's the what's the most popular one? Is like forest fruits. <laughs> what's even that? <laughs> There's no fruits in our forests. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you could get ling yeah, lingonberry cider. Might be nice. You might get. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you if you call berries fruits, which I don't. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we call them fruits because they are KJ. <laughs> <laughs> that being I mean, said, I haven't yeah. seen any lingonberry cider, so uh, it might be a reason for that. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised IKEA don't sell it. Yeah. Everything else is yeah. lingonberry there, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> it's a backbone of Sweden. <laughs> That that's the thing, though. Um, when I was in the army, I uh, for a, a year I worked in the kitchen, and I realized that everything you can get in the stores, you can also get like in bulk for like industrial sized kitchens. And of course you can, but as a regular consumer, you don't think about that before you're made aware of it. You can get like uh, cheese on a roll uh, with. Uh, that uh, wrapping paper in the roll so you can just pull out two meters of white cheese if you want to and just tear it off like a, a roll of paper. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> a, ro a roll of cheese? Remember? Yeah, yeah, you got them in like huge wheels uh, already sliced and rolled up. So, uh, of course, uh, when a thousand soldiers are going to eat lunch, they just pick their bread and then just tear off whatever they need. And, of course, <laughs> w working in the kitchen, we took... We started cutting the loaves lengthwise just to make these huge ass sandwiches because we had cheese and sausages on rolls. So you could just drag a half a meter out and just put it on. <laughs> I mean, this but, this uh, is the nation that brings us brown cheese. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, you got that as well. <laughs> and uh, also, in that, you, either you get it in like bulk, but you also get like small packages like for rations and so on so it's like a teeny tiny cute ones but that's uh that's brilliant and that that kind of makes me i'm also interested in statistics and like how much lingonberry does ikea buy every year it, it would be nice to see those budget <laughs> numbers i mean how many tons of lingonberry do they process through their warehouses in a year <laughs> it's like it's ridiculously large numbers yeah. that's why people from Asia come to to pick the berries in the forest. Otherwise, it would just go go to waste. But we import those yeah. people from Thailand instead. That's rather weird. I think I think you are you are right that a berry is not a fruit. Technically, it's like no, nothing is a vegetable. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's yeah. it all it all goes very strange when you start dissecting it and try to divide things what are what they actually are instead of what people think they are. So, yeah, I try to stay away from biology in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I've come to realize that most things have individual names. So, I mean, if you say a tomato, people know what you're talking about. So you don't have to know if it's a fruit or a vegetable or a tree or... A... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it comes down to the, the weird quirks of English that... You know, we have the culinary and the botanical thing. So a, a vegetable is whatever someone who's a cook decided is a vegetable. You know, why is why is a pear not a vegetable? Because broccoli is the flowers of a, of a, a broccoli <laughs> bush. Celery is a stalk. <laughs> Carrot is a root. Potatoes are tubers. Yeah. You know, all of these things have other botanical names. And someone just went, fruit, 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 not a fruit, 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 <laughs> <laughs> vegetable. <laughs> But fruit, fruit is a botanical term. You're right. <laughs> it uh, always amazed me. I think it's um, it's like the parsnip or turnip is in the brassica class, which is cabbages, kale, and all of that. Which are... it's, no, it's not. It's a root vegetable. It's not a brassica. <laughs> Treat it as a brassica. <laughs> but there we go. Let's not go down that route. Oh, <laughs> terrible. No, James, turn, you... turn over another leaf. <laughs> <laughs> I have to put in a drum roll on that. I mean, James, I think you're you're one of you have the typical maker disease of wanting to do everything and being interested in most everything. So why did you end up in medicine? 
Because I, I feel I like you would, you must have been standing there staring at a lot of diff- different options when choosing what to study. So I wanted to do something practical. And I thought, engineering. Engineering is where you make things. And at school, when we're, I think, 16 or 15, you go and do work experience. You're sent off to somewhere that either the school arranges for you, in which case you go to do floor sweeping in a factory and you know, <laughs> hate it. Or if you're organized enough, you can go and pick something that you want to do. So I went to a company called Kinetic uh, down at Boscombe Down. Um, they used to be kind of a part of the military airspace and then <clears throat> I think they were bought out. But uh, they do aeronautical engineering. And the first day we went into the workshop and we made uh, some dice I've still got that live on my shelf in aluminium. So she just to treat it to like cut some metal, put some little divots in with a drill and then polish it. I thought, this is it. This is what I want to do. And the next day we went to the engineering department and looked at people working on computers. And I thought, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I always liked science. And biology, I did, I did biology, physics, chemistry, maths as far as I could in school. And... <clears throat> I didn't want to do hard science. I didn't want to be a chemist or a physicist. Um, I wanted to do some sort of applied science. And I think the appeal of medicine is that it's incredibly broad. So I never really knew exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew what I liked. And I thought with medicine, you can go and you can change your career halfway through. You You can be a medical student for five years knowing that you want to be a cardiologist and do your first two years in training where you get sent around different departments do one rotation in cardiology and figure out that you hate it and no one no one's any the wiser you can just go off and pick something else instead and so even when you pick your career um so i i was going to be an anesthetist uh, for a long time i thought maybe i'll do emergency medicine and i did the training pathway that let me do both uh, COVID happened and my planned round the world trip year off got uh, postponed and I ended up doing a lot of intensive care and most intensive care doctors are anaesthetists by background but you don't have to be and slowly over the past four years I've realized I'm not going to be an anaesthetist I'm going to do intensive care and uh, some sort of design so I did my master's in healthcare and design and that has kind of pushed me to be kind of doing systems design and team management stuff and making decisions rather than doing anesthetics so even now i'm i'm changing what i'm doing i think that's the really nice thing about medicine is just how flexible you can be that if in five years time i'm bored of doing that i can go off and be uh a, you know, retrain a little bit and do a different type of intensive care or i could go and work in the private sector and do something in the farm you know pharma company I don't think I will, but it's nice to have that option. And are you still uh, hands on with the patients yeah. in what you do now? Yeah, yeah, very much. I was uh, on call this weekend. Um, so the way it works is that we have consultants who are kind of the the most senior level. I'm the next step down. So at night time, I'm the most senior person in the hospital for intensive care, and often that means that when things go wrong, people call you. Uh, rather than calling their consultants so you end up doing a lot of emergency stuff uh, which I really like like I really like the the skills bit of it you end up learning a lot of procedures um, being the person that turns up to emergencies and people go can anyone do this you know yeah yeah I suppose I can I haven't done it for a while but (laughs) none of you know how to do it and it's an emergency so okay that's me then does that have any effect on you mentally dealing with emergencies i mean i can imagine it's pretty gruesome at times it can be it's it's few and far between to be honest because you you spend so long preparing for emergencies that really it's it's kind of you know you just do the thing that you've been trained to do you know you're you do so much simulation and so much you know so many exams and so much learning you don't really connect it to it being a human in an emergency it's just this is the emergency and you know what you need to do. And almost all the time, because I I do adult intensive care, you're dealing with people who 
have lived quite a long life and as a result of their choices in life are unwell rather than you know the the one exception to that is trauma where someone's hit by a car often or sometimes it's not their fault um, but almost all the things we see are kind of a result of you know it's not bad luck most of the time but yeah you do you do kind of distance yourself a bit from the person otherwise you'd you wouldn't be able to do what you need to yeah you um you ever have to do anybody any, any emergency treatments to anybody at makers central um after they've drunk too much of your beer <laughs> or anything like that uh, <laughs> I, I probably did, but I can't remember. I drank too much of my beer too. <laughs> <laughs> it was mainly wandering around, telling people that you need to say the swallow flies at midnight and knock on door five six two. But <laughs> I could have, I could have been misconstrued a number of ways. Thankfully, it was just the uh, uh, the the speakeasy that I set up on the second year. That's legendary. That's um, I mean I I obviously just met you, but. Um... It's been on so many talked about on so many podcasts. The speakeasy, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, make makers waffle in particular. It was, it was fun. So I had a couple of people say, "Oh, you know, like, are you going to bring any beer?" Because as molten make, I think the as much as I don't brew a lot of beer, I brew a lot more beer than almost everyone else in the maker community. Yeah. And I thought, well, I could I could bring some, but yeah, you know, the first year I bought bottles, and bottles are a real pain because you have to bring them back, and you know people will not necessarily drink all of the bottle or they'll put it down and then they'll just get another one. And it's a lot of work to hand fill as many bottles as I wanted to take. So in the end, I thought I've got to take kegs. So there are a few options for uh, eco kegs because it's actually cheaper to, or it's, it's environmentally better not to waste the, the CO2 emissions shipping stainless steel kegs back a lot of the time. So they're a plastic container with a bag inside and you pump any gas you want between the plastic outer side and the bag inside. Mm. The difficulty, if you yes. obviously, if you with a stainless steel keg, you can pump air in, but then the beer oxidizes. So it serves two purposes for me, that I could bring them and then leave them to be recycled. And I also didn't then have to bring a CO2 tank along to, to prevent the beer going stale and yeah. keep it carbonated. So in the end, I brought, I think it was 60 litres of beer and 40 of coffee, but it might have been 80 and 20, um, <laughs> which... But surely at Maker Central, there is a welding company or something that have a bottle or two of argon gas standing aloud. You would think, <laughs> you would <laughs> think. <laughs> and, but weirdly, I, so I, I took it to the Hilton and you know, held this speakeasy in my room. And I think Johnny from Brothers Makes like, oh, you should bring it into the hall the next day. And... You know, dutifully on this boiling hot day, I, I pushed this incredibly top-heavy uh, beer dispensing cart that I'd built. Um, Richard from Wood Seats Wood Seats had made me a, a pallet wood logo that I'd stuck to the front. And I pushed this all the way there. You know, no one offered to help, of course. Everyone else was still in bed. <laughs> I got, got to the NEC and suddenly thought, are they going to let me in? I thought, okay, well, let's let's just see. I got to the door and someone said, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh no, I can't believe I've pushed this all the way here. And you went, Do you want a hand pushing it up the ramp? That looks quite heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the show in which people carry six foot swords into, isn't yeah. it? I mean, nobody bats an eye. No, <laughs> they, were, they were really nice. And then I thought, Okay, right, well, that's that bit. Now I can dispense some beer based on the pressure that's in there, but I really need to chill it. Oh, I'll just plug it into. Um, uh, so the one of the um, stands they offered me use of kind of a side bit behind, and they said, "Oh, look, we've got I think up to six hundred watts of power or some some amount." All they had was some uh, as John from uh, Multi or some Multi Multi Tool. He does the two by seventy two grinders amongst other things, and yeah. really nice guy. And he said, "Look, just, just park it behind there, and we'll be fine." I've only got an LED sign; it's using three or four watts of power. You've got hundreds; you'll be fine. <laughs> I plug it in and the stand cuts the power. <laughs> like, oh, okay, fine. And I was like, oh look, there's just yeah, you know, little um, RCD. I'll just I'll just turn it back on, and we'll go again. Same thing happened. And as it turns out, anyone who works in the events industry knows this. On the first day, they estimate kind of your peak power based on. They say, look, turn everything on. We'll see how much power you use, and they set a limit for you. 
So they know that each stand at most is going to be drawing this much power. So they can manage the power demands of the event. Of course, his 5-watt LED sign at peak, plus maybe his phone charger, uh, was slightly less than the 200 watts of cooling power of my beer, <laughs> beer cart. <laughs> so I, you know, when when we said to the, the event team, they're like, oh, well, yeah, that that's why. And they said, look, what are you doing? I, I, I thought, look, at this point, I'm either going to have to confess or just like try and play it sly. And I thought, I'll just tell them what I'm doing. And they went, that's that's and I'm not going to do the the the, you know, the thick brummy accent that he had, but he's like, look, there's an extension cord hidden in the in the like cleaning cupboard over there, and the plug by the main door is separate from everything else. Run that cable from there to your beer machine, and then you can serve beer for the event. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's how I managed to get away with it, and uh, I suspect it will be the only year I get away with it. But, um, <laughs> Who knows? It just it's unbelievable that you can just give beer away there. I mean, it's uh, like the make with make us done last year with the big box of cider on the desk, just wrapped in wrapping paper so nobody noticed. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was actually uh, an important part of our stand to hold things in place. It was our special gravity clamp. <laughs> hey, everybody, drink this incredibly strong cider. Help the kids make this. <laughs> My daughter got away on skate. It's all I good. remember. She, yeah. <laughs> I on the last episode, you were saying, oh, yeah, I was, I, I was there next to James. And I was thinking, God, I'm, ne- I'm there next to Glenn. I don't want to too shy to introduce myself. <laughs> you, you didn't know me then. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I'm realizing there that, uh, of course, a, a few years uh, ahead in time, uh, I'm going to be faced with a paradox because, of course, the kids are going to grow up and they're going to go out uh, drinking, of course. And as a maker and a previous master of disguising drinks to get it into <laughs> venues, I mean, I have so much experience here. I mean, uh, from a resealing Pringles cans uh, with uh, <laughs> weight appropriate, the drinks canister inside there. And now, of course, uh, you can order these um I mean, it's it's boxed wine is now a, a big thing in Norway, and the plastic liners you you can buy them for uh, home brewing. And of course, uh, a friend of mine he just taped that to his belly because if he's just tapping down, it just feels like you, you have a bit of extra padding, and so nobody even <laughs> bats an eye. And then he just flips out the the nozzle <laughs> between the two buttons on yeah. his shirt, and it's, it's just pouring <laughs> alcohol for everyone around. I mean, that's the worst kind. That of... kind of knowledge is it's like I see it as a challenge. All right, so you're going to a concert. <laughs> I want to bring something to drink. I mean, that's the, <laughs> what can we do? That's this the time? question I've felt all along with having kids. Should you power level them in your in your field, so to say, because you have a lot of knowledge, and then after a couple of years, years you realize that your kids do not want to listen to you, even if you have all the answers in the world. They want to find out for themselves. And that's really, really hard for me to take. Mm. Please, can you at least take some of my life experience? Maybe it works (laughs) when it comes to smuggling drinks. I don't know. Uh. I think it's a period where you can imprint it with them, give them like the baseline, and then they have to go off and do their own thing. And of course, they will at some point realize that, all right, this is actually in line with what mom and dad is doing as well. And then you reconnect over it uh, when they have gotten the uh, couple of years where they need to be opposed everything you do and stand for. At least that's my hope and plan. <laughs> I mean, and I'm just sitting here thinking, I'm glad you said unbuttoned on his shirt and not on trousers. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, I promise it's, wa- it's wine from a bag. <laughs> oh, we had um, <laughs> a, friend, a friend of mine. He is... Uh, now is working as a nurse uh, in a, a psychiatric institution. But of course, when he was studying, you have these, um, instead of catheters, it's like a condom with a tube and you have a bag wrapped around your foot. 
and he was going to a rock concert and they are famous for playing long concerts and he was planning i'm going to be there at the marsh pit i'm going to stand there for hours drinking beer and if you have to go and pee mm-hmm. you either lose your place and obviously often you you can't get anywhere so you are forced to just uh, squat down and pee there and then and like but I have access to all this. So he taped himself up and he went the entire night just pissing and standing and drinking beer. It's marvelous. And then, so, uh, so genius. Yeah. And then, of course, the uh, this is something that I have only thought about in theory, but I've got a confirmation that it, it would actually work. But you have these bags with the drip when you're putting like uh, water in or nutrients or whatever. Of course, that drip can easily be calculated. So if you, of course, you can't use pure alcohol in your bloodstream, but you can put alcohol water down in a bag and you can actually calculate what is your level of intoxicity. And then you don't have the problem with drinking too much too fast and then you are peaking and then you are crashing on the other end. So you could just find a nice bus and just set it there and you could just have that bag of course they would look a bit strange uh, out on town if you're if you're walking with that uh, uh four wheeled uh, <laughs> <laughs> holder with the bag and all the tubes but surely you could uh, put it in your inside pocket of your jacket and uh, hook it up further down how often would you have to shake it or otherwise so you so it doesn't segment in a way because alcohol it should so it shouldn't it should dissolve because if you think you're if you leave your bottle of vodka it doesn't separate out into water and alcohol but the really interesting thing is that that only works with a few medication alcohol being one of them because alcohol is metabolized at a set amount per hour so one unit per hour roughly whereas if you think most most drugs you metabolize uh, so that the, the alcohol is metabolized by zeroth order metabolism. That's where you take a certain amount of it and get rid of it from your body every hour. Most drugs are first order. You get rid of half of it. That's why half life is a thing. So yeah. alcohol, you can do that because you can just put one unit in per hour and you stay the same. Rather than most drugs, if you put in five units of alcohol, it would cut to two and a half, then 1.25, and you'd have to constantly change the rate of the infusion. So there is a, a weird quirk that alcohol <laughs> lets you do that. And it's also, I, I remember, it was probably also not politically correct, but I think it was in high school, one of our chemistry teachers. I mean, how much, of course, based on your body weight and so on, and if you were a boy or a girl, uh, then how much do you need to get at a certain level? And then, of course, how long would it take before you are, like, good to drive or whatever and then of course we uh, we had some fun with the with the equations because if you have like a, a carlsberg uh, like a truck it have like eleven thousand liters of beer or something i mean how long could you stay at a certain bus uh, <laughs> um, it was years i think it was uh, like six or seven years you could be on a bus because of that you just you need an, a set amount. You could drink a six pack, and then you had a nice bus going. And then you just need to keep that at the same rate as you just mentioned. I mean, one in, one out after a certain time. And I mean, with a lorry full of beer, you could keep going for years. <laughs> yeah. Of course, not. Uh, I mean, you you would have some side effects <laughs> and uh, yeah. <laughs> liver failure. I mean, you can switch <laughs> the calculation around. What kind of how bust would you have to be if you would drink that entire truck before it went bad? Mm. Probably dead. <laughs> <laughs> At least I would. Yeah. But uh... It's a challenge worth pos- participating in because you really wouldn't want to see all that beer go bad. You? <laughs> yeah. You've got to give it a go. <laughs> but do we not, um, do we not um, build up a tolerance to alcohol? You do. So that's why... Yeah. One unit per hour is a good estimate. And actually, over yeah. it's not a linear scale. So there was someone who um, does research on drugs. And 
looked at a kind of number of people drinking alcohol and said, how do you feel? Monitored their blood alcohol level and kind of drew a graph of their metabolism. And it's it's not a line. Um, and it's it, it's actually quite interesting. So the there's a Mitchell and Webb sketch that talks about the one and a half pints of beer that you are, you feel great after one and a half pints of beer. And if you have two, everything goes, you know, goes to pot. <laughs> Yeah, and there was two politicians, and they they, you know, they 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 solved all the world's uh, you know issues by having one and a half pints, and to congratulate themselves, they finished the half pint, and it all goes wrong. <laughs> but, but they found that actually alcohol, which is a sedative, effectively, it, it kind of turns things down in your brain. The reason you you kind of get a bit elated is because it turns down the inhibitory, but that's why it's quite dangerous because it stop it, it turns off the bit that yeah. says don't have another beer. <laughs> but it actually turns off the slowing down bits of your brain first. So it is a bit of a stimulant at the beginning. That's why everyone, you, know, you have your first beer on, on a night out and you feel better. You you feel really excited yeah. and you have your second and then you feel quite tired. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's <laughs> rather easy to see this if you do something kind of competitive, like go bowling or darts or something like that and drinking beer constantly, you see, mm. you go up and then your performance goes down and it does not come back. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I play pool better after a skinful. <laughs> <Yeah>. Definitely. <laughs> Has anybody done a study on why afternoon beers have more of an effect than evening beers? Oh, I feel the opposite. I think, I think, really? yeah, so I think day drinking is easier. Because there's, there's a certain oh, yeah. point in your life when you're you're at university and you're like, you know, right, it's it's eight o'clock. I've had my entire bowl of pasta with nothing on. We're going to go on a night out, and you know, you can do that. And then you get a bit older yeah. and you start to think, actually, if I if I have a beer, at, you know, a couple of beers at lunch on my birthday, we'll all have we'll all have a drink. I'll feel great, and you manage that. So I think I think daytime alcohol is is the is the the late late young age it's not middle age it's late young age uh, safety mechanism but it, it, that it might be a concoction of a lot of variables <laughs> yeah. and i think you're touching on, on some of them i i feel the same way and of course i usually have only that one drink because you are a semi-responsible adult as well and in weekends or at your birthday or whatever, you can have that in the middle of the day because then you're you're most awake anyway, so you get the most out of it, and then you can still be in bed by <laughs> nine, which is the optimal time that you are aiming for. Because I can't remember the last time I went out after ten on any day and had drinks with someone, and then was back some time over midnight. I'm in. The, <laughs> I'm mentally asleep mm. way before that anyway so oh well, we weirdly I can remember the last time I did that it was a few days ago and I went to teach on a conference uh in Manchester and you know obviously my wife's looking after our daughter I thought oh this is nice you know we I'll I'll take take the opportunity and I uh, went out with the rest of the course and we, we had a couple of beers and by the time we got back it was midnight I thought okay well this is far later than I'd planned but fine went into the room and thought oh I can't find the switch how embarrassing oh here it is it doesn't work oh I, I must have to put my key card for the hotel in the door you know somewhere spent good 10 minutes looking for it thinking I don't want to be the person who's had you know two and a half beers and can't find how to turn the lights on <laughs> <laughs> gets, gets to twenty past midnight, and I'm thinking this is this is ridiculous. This is far too late now. Yeah, you know, we'd just we'd just gone for a few drinks after dinner, and we thought it was all going to be okay. And here I am at twenty past midnight, can't find the switch. I reluctantly call the reception, and they said, "No, there's a uh, there's nothing you have to do. You just turn the lights on." And they said, "Don't worry, we'll we'll come up and show you where the switch is." And I thought, "Oh no, this is so embarrassing." <laughs> I've adopted it. <laughs> <laughs> half, half past midnight now. They come up to the room and I've there. I've propped the door open with the terrible ironing board that's in there, so I had any light. And they went, "Oh no, no, they're broken." And so then, then it got. By the time they then relocated me to another room with lights that worked, it was about half past one, almost two o'clock. And I thought, "Oh, this, <laughs> this is the punishment I get for trying to trying to stay out late." <laughs> 
I, I had, I think it was last week I had, I think I had a gin and tonic and then the next day I felt like I've been on a bender and I like, I mean, I'm feeling so bad that I, I don't want to drive my car to work. This, it feels like I'm really hung over, but this doesn't make sense. And of course I don't uh, drink as I did, uh, in my uni days anymore but surely it's i should handle more than one glass of gt and then of course my uh, oldest daughter came and i'm not feeling very well and then the youngest one threw up in a bucket and uh, of course okay uh, <laughs> we have the flu so that uh, <laughs> explained why i was uh, feeling a bit upset because i got the same symptoms as them yeah. during the later of the day so yeah it's not that one drink but for a couple of hours there in the morning, I was sitting like, can't I even handle one glass of drink and can't drive the day after? I, I feel really terrible and hungover, but yeah, <laughs> surely it wasn't that. <laughs> when you said your daughter came and said, I'm not feeling very well, I thought you were going to say that at that point, I realized I shouldn't give my daughter such a <laughs> before bedtime. <laughs> I think, uh, I think my generation or basically our parents' generation are the last one where they could uh, pull off putting like a cognac or, or something uh, in your uh, bottle to, uh, to mm. soothe you if you were restless or crying or something. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, sh surely it works, but uh, doing that today and speaking uh, openly about it, then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> someone will take you away. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, all parents, I mean, you understand why they did it because they didn't have that much knowledge of why it would be bad and that sort of thing. I mean, if you, yeah. if you have one of those nights when they just don't stop crying, you would willingly try anything that wouldn't mm. harm them. Yeah. But th this was in the 80s. Uh, we lived for one year in Copenhagen in Denmark and of course, I, I was in kindergarten and my mom could tell me that it was kind of usual that a lot of the kids were a bit peppy when they were dropped off in the morning because it was usual to have a beer at breakfast and the kids got what they call the quarts. So it was like a half milk glass of beer. <laughs> and of course, for someone at the four or five years of age, that is enough to <laughs> to give them a boost in the morning. <laughs> And of course, uh, some friends of the family has also worked for several years in, in France. And I mean, they are still on the top of uh, uh, liver <laughs> alcohol related diseases and they have it in children. I mean, they, they serve still wine to their kids from their like uh, six, seven years old at dinner and so on. So uh, now they have kids friendly or watered down wine mm. uh, to just ease them into the tradition, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's still a thing. <laughs> That's interesting. When you go to France, the um, you know you go into a restaurant or a bar, you'll see the French just generally nursing one or two drinks over the, with the you know the period of a whole night where, you know, that's not what we do in England <laughs> for sure. And um, you know, so maybe it's not such a bad thing, giving kids a little bit and getting them used to it and getting so they're over the novelty of drinking. Mm. I don't know. Well, I'm not going to say I'm going to start giving my daughter drinks, but... <laughs> but there's a there's a latitude or like a geographical latitude um, alcohol you know, culture thing in the in the southern regions of Europe. It's all wine. You go a little bit further north, it's beer. You go further north, it's spirits. Yeah, and it's the same that you know in France it is a glass of wine culture. In the UK, it's a pint culture. If you you. Know, yeah. For you know, uh, thankfully, attitudes are, are slightly different. But if you ever ordered a half pint, people would say, "Oh, are you okay? Are you feeling all right?" <laughs> Whereas in in many other places in Cologne, Germany, so yeah, they have small glasses of beer, and the idea being yeah. you know, they they stay cold and you just drink small glasses. But it is interesting how you know, those cultural differences. You know, we would you know classically English people thinking, "What do you mean one glass of wine? You mean three pints of beer at lunch?" <laughs> that was a very normal yeah, you can yeah. you can look at bbc uh documentaries from the 70s of people what did you have for lunch i had a sandwich and two pints of beer 
but it was three <laughs> three point something percent. But still, every day that was your lunch. Yeah, healthy. <laughs> yeah, didn't know didn't know any better. But that was really fun in uni because Thursday evenings were the like the great night out. Everyone was out on the town and. Of course, our, our local pub, where most of the people from the university went to, they started having wine nights. And they had, it was usually a, a relatively decent red and white wine that they served. And of course, we started drinking wine. But the first couple of weeks, of course, me and my friends, we were just used to drinking like beers, unless you were drinking like drinking spirits or something. But uh, as a poor student, you kept to beer. But then, of course, now you had an alternative, also drinking wine at the same price. And then, of course, uh, I bought a bottle of red and my friend bought a bottle of white and we could just alternate and, and, and try various and we got so hung over and of course one thing is that you react differently to various kinds of wine but we drank them at the rate that we did beer not just thinking that it has three times the alcohol content per glass it's, so we didn't think about that so we just keep drinking at the same pace and it, after a couple of weeks being extremely hung over we started like there, there's a pattern. <laughs> and then, all right, four versus twelve, thirteen percent alcohol level. That's a that's a difference. I think the really nice thing now is the availability of low alcohol or alcohol free beer. That's good. Yeah, it, it's become yeah, really good actually. in the last couple of years. Mm. I was in when I was in Manchester for the conference. I went to Cloudwater, and they're a relatively new you know probably five six years maybe a little bit more craft brewery who have made some brilliant beers and they do a 0.5 percent beer so legally in the uk alcohol free same as traditional lemonade or an overripe banana in terms of how much alcohol is in that and mm -hmm. it's brilliant it is really hoppy it does i can tell it's alcohol free but it's amazing it's not like a you know most of the alcohol-free beers you get are lagers, and you can kind of tell it's not the same. This is you know really hoppy and fresh, and tastes like craft beer, but is almost alcohol-free. Yeah, I was really impressed. The Guinness uh, Zero Zero is really good as well. Mm. For I mean, you, you can tell it. I mean, it's not. I mean, it it feels like a proper Guinness, but without alcohol. So that's yeah. And I mean, like. Five ten years ago, when you ordered an alcohol-free beer, you would be happy if you ha if they had anything, and it would taste rather bad. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. but still, it is. I I, I drink uh, alcohol-free beer if there's a uh, like an event at work uh, and I need to get up early the next day, or if it is at a place where I would like to drive home. And of course, still, it feels weird spending an entire evening drinking alcohol-free beer and then you go and sit in your car and like it feels so wrong when you're turning the <laughs> and key and you can taste still... the uh, beer on your yeah and th and then there's the other people at the the, the event they see you staggering off uh, getting into the car and like hey what are you doing and just, at one time i needed to show them the actual bottle mm -hmm. this is what i've been drinking <laughs> but the worst is i was at one company event where um I brought uh, my own alcohol-free beer and then just in the middle of the night and uh, the, the conversations were great and everybody was having fun and then someone just realized, wait, are, are you drinking alcohol-free beer? And we are sitting here on a bus and they <laughs> they were so shocked and they actually felt betrayal. <laughs> you're sitting here cheating us? We are getting drunk and sharing things and you're just playing along and having fun and then you're going to go home and like, yeah. not be hung over tomorrow yeah. i mean <laughs> you just get the contact with us and... you're gonna enjoy your day tomorrow <laughs> yeah. How you? <laughs> i've never seen the point in alcohol free beer i'll be honest I, if i'm not drinking i'd rather just drink pop I, i'd rather have a coke i like the taste of it so it's i don't i don't see the point in drinking alcohol free beer i don't get so, it sodas are too sweet for me these days mm. so yeah yeah, I'm the same. I I like, yeah, I'll have a 
an orangina or something as a treat because it's the sort of thing you'd have on holiday. Uh, but I don't like the aftertaste of sugar-free things. Oh, that's and good, but... I, you know, I'll get again. Like I'll have a Coca-Cola maybe a couple of times a year, just something. Oh, why not? I haven't had one of those in a while. And then you remember yeah. why <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah alcohol I, I mean i quite like fizzy water sparkling waters because uh, i have beer taps at home um and i can't remember the last time we put beer on we just fill the kegs with water and we have sparkling water instead still still doesn't help with the reflux <laughs> in the same way as, <laughs> as beer, but helps with the calories and the the alcohol <laughs> That, that, that's the thing. I've been wanting it to it's the reflux with the fizzy drinks, but also I enjoy a Coke. I mean, if it's warm outside and it's really cold uh, and with ice and so on, then it's I can enjoy it. But still, it's it's the sugar and it's becoming. I mean, it's coming with age that it's. Uh, you, I, I don't feel good if I get too much sugar, but it is the most addictive I have ever come across. Uh, of course, I remember uh, quite a few years ago, I, I, I quit uh, this, this news, which is the Scandinavian tobacco, and that was really hard. And I, I still can... F- I know that if I tried it today, I would get sick, but I, I still have that urge after dinner or something. It would be nice to just put one in mm-hmm. because you remember everything associated with it. But... I've also had several times tried to cutting down on sugar just because I really don't like too much of it, but it's fascinating to see how the, the body still craves it. And of course, today, of course, the I think the sugar mafia is even worse than the tobacco mafia, but it, it's not talked as much about, but they put sugar in everything, mm. even things that shouldn't need sugar in it in the first yeah. place and still taste great. So mm. it's really hard to come off of sugar, I've realized. And uh, probably that's uh, explaining some of my moods at work <laughs> this week. <laughs> and I feel that the longer you're off sugar, the better it tastes when, when you get it. Yeah. yeah. So you can... I guess everything in moderation, yeah. including moderation itself. That's my thing. <laughs> <Not only> you. <laughs> <laughs> you do. You have, to, you have to have times where you have an entire bag of Haribo to yourself. You don't. You don't have. You don't yeah. do it again for eight years. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if you are a, a moderate uh, uh, sweets eater, then just uh, live with a person that isn't. Because then, if you eat your half a bag and put it away, and the next time you come back, the half bag is gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know the yeah. feeling. <laughs> <laughs> very much the case in this house as well that (laughs) yeah and the easiest thing is to just not buy it of course but if it's in the house it will get eaten and then of course there's a hierarchy of uh of course uh the the smash chocolate is high on that list and then you go down and of course at the bottom end you have the the haribo candy that the kids got for halloween and so on but if that's the only thing there is that's the one thing that's going to be eaten <laughs> I mean, that's really interesting I, I realized that a couple of times even when you buy pick and mix and you only pick your favorites only take the good candy but even so you're left with some something that you don't really want to eat at the bottom of the bag <laughs> why is that <laughs> yeah but you start with the best ones and then of course uh when you get uh juiced up on sugar it's like oh, yeah. <laughs> it starts to uh, fill up and then of course the they're still uh, on your favorite list but they're not as appetizing yeah. anymore so they're left there in the bottom <laughs> of the bag my my gut feeling is it's the hunter gatherer Brief, well, you know, a bit of us. <laughs> it's the same with tools. I mean, you know, which is more fun? Is it finding the tool or is it using the tool the seventh or eighth time? You know, it's yeah. every, every every hobby has their vice, but the finding it is fun for everyone. Finding the pick yeah, and mix is fun. Definitely. Eating the pick and mix at the end is not as fun. <laughs> I really like a lot of the tools I have, but you still think, oh, I could have another tool. I'll go and hunt and gather it. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say that, but that's not the same because 
once you have a drill, then, but then I'd realize, no, <laughs> it's, it's the same because I have drills, but I can still be in the store and uh, I should get, Ooh, this one has like an angle that after mm. and I get that one. I'm just as giddy about that, even if it's my fourth or fifth drill. Yeah. It's like, I like this one. Still, I still want to go and look at the festival ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, have a, I really like my, my the Milwaukee drill I've got. It's really good. <laughs> I'm still going to go and look at all the tools when I go to the tool shop anyway. <laughs> that, that would be interesting because I think... If I bring my GPS with me next time I go to the hardware store, because when if I go there, as I sometimes do without having anything specific I need to buy, but I got an hour to kill before I need to go and pick someone up, and I just drop off the hardware store. And There are some aisles I always walk past just to see how they got anything new or if it's something that I want, but maybe not today, and... I think there would be a very recognizable pattern <laughs> and it would be nice then to map that out to the contents of those aisles. Just, is there something in my subconscious? Like, of course it's screws, ropes, uh, handles, hinges and all that. And then of course it's the Bosch sections, but are there someone that I'm, I don't think that I'm interested in, but I always find myself going up and down that aisle. I, I know what mine are. Minor threaded plumbing fittings, <laughs> which is really weird. <laughs> but every time I'm you know, ordering something from a company, I think, oh, I wonder if they've got any threaded plumbing fittings because you know for brewing or machines or you know, oh I need a a half inch to five eighths inch BSP adapter in stainless steel. Oh damn, I've not got one. That and that and tape. Oh. I think tape is the one of the best <laughs> inventions ever. You can never have enough tape, that's uh, for sure. Um, I found some Tyvek tape the other day. It was like the uh, the kind of house covering, waterproof ah, yeah. things that people you know <laughs> turn into wallets and things. It's Tyvek, yeah. but it's tape and you can stick it to stuff and it's really good. I don't know what I want <laughs> nice. it for, but I, I really want some. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, stuff that is... Re- I actually... Uh... I got a bag from uh, AliExpress here a couple of weeks ago and I opened one of them up and it was a roll of tape, waterproof tape. And, ooh, very nice. But I'd never ordered that. So I had to start looking at the package. Uh, oh, th- this is not addressed to me. But they do, if you order a lot of different items, they go to a sorting center mm-hmm. before it's shipped out. So they group them together probably to save on shipping costs. And someone else's package has just been bundled together with mine by error and like, Ooh, I got the tape now. It made my day. <laughs> and of course, it doesn't make sense to try and find that person to send him his $2 roll of tape. Mm. So, I mean, he wouldn't even be interested if I contacted him. So, <laughs> I mean, it's mine now. I got a present from um, Tim Turgworks delivered on Saturday, and it was wrapped in pink gaffer tape. It looked like I'd had a present delivered from Laura Camp. It was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> There's a set of chisels just in case you're wondering, James. <laughs> I'm just, I was just jealous. I was thinking the, the yeah. Rubio King has bestowed something upon you. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I messaged him on, on the Friday and said, you know, I'm making this lathe. I just want to buy one wood chisel from Amazon, which is the most universal thing I can buy and I'll have it here tomorrow and I can just just I just wanted to do a bit of footage after finishing the uh, lathe he said oh don't worry about it I'll send you one I said no I need it I really need it for tomorrow so I'll get I'll get them there for you tomorrow and bless him he did did it yeah so thanks Tim he's a a good egg isn't he nice he's all (laughs) (laughs) I do I do love that about the maker community though sending sending posts like I, I yeah. very rarely get anything except you know, bills and uh, adverts in the post, and I really like sending people nice posts. So uh, Jamie Reader, the Custom Cave, and I are doing the leatherworking stand on uh, Make with Makers for Maker Central, and I designed some key rings, same similar to the ones last year, um, and 
he said, oh, can, I wonder if they'll check. So I, I sent him the file. He 3D printed out a thing, cut around it in his leather and said, oh, I think this will work. And I thought, no, no, I'm going to send you some leather. So I, I've hot foil pressed lots of envelopes. And I just think it's something so nice about sending like this proper, you know, almost like a present, you know, whether it's yeah. whether it's covered in pink gaffer tape or uh, I've had uh, Mr. Dyson, uh, Dyson Every Film has sent me a few things and every time he does, he changes the name on it to something, uh, something rude. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Surprise, <price. laughs> yeah. So, well, I think we might be in we might be in half pint territory now. So you you can you can say a few things if you like. <laughs> so I think we, we need to be in shot glass territory for the names he puts. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 